children are invited to go to Children's Church this morning. Thank you, worship team, for leading us this morning. Wonderful opportunity to be led by such a gifted group of people. This morning you can uh, follow along with some notes in your bulletin if you'd like to take notes. Uh, we are also on the YouVersion Bible app, so if you want to click on the YouVersion Bible app, you are free to do that as well. I'd like to invite Tanya to come forward, Tanya Perkins, who works with our youth. Uh, she is one of our Bible quiz coaches, and uh, for those of you that have been here for a few weeks in a row, you know that uh, as a lead-in to our sermons, we have been allowing different Bible quizzers, those who are studying the book of Jonah this year, to quote for us the passage that we'll be studying and looking at today. Uh, so I invited Tanya to, to do that this morning as one of our coaches, and uh, she's going to pick up in Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. So if you want to follow along, either on your devices or in a pew Bible, Jonah 3, 5, and she's going to go all the way to the end of Jonah. So let's follow along and listen as Tanya quotes for us. Okay. The Ninevites believed God, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let every people and animal, herds and flocks, Do not, do not sorry, do not, let, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let, animal, let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let them, let everyone, <clears throat> let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they repented and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring destruction he did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a, you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord said, but, but the Lord replied, sorry. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had, set, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his, his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I am so angry, I wish I were dead. But the, Lord, but the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. Should I not be concerned about the people, should I not be concerned about the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Thank you, Tanya. Really excited about our Bible quizzing ministry. As you know, I support Bible quizzers and our youth who are learning, memorizing, hiding God's word in their hearts. Uh, it's a powerful, powerful thing, and it's uh, powerful when the adults and the coaches do it too. Amen? Amen. So thank you, Tanya, for sharing with us. Chances are you met somebody this week who was, uh, or you crossed paths with somebody, or maybe you just uh, overheard an angry person. Anybody? Anybody relate to that this week? Um, we meet a lot of angry people in the world, don't we? Um, 
There's the uh, about to burst people, right? You can, I have the picture of a mom at the end of a day with her kids, right? The, the about to burst person, right? Uh, the anger's been tamped down. It's under control, but it's about to go off, right? I hear a little laughter there, right? We have the already bursted people, of course, right? Those are the people that just lash out, all, I think, of politicians, right? Or maybe your anger toward the politicians, right? So there's the already bursted kind of people. There's the, the don't cross me people, right? The, uh, what are you looking at me? Huh? What are you saying to me, right? That, think of New York City, right? You can't walk down the street and look somebody in the eye, right? You get that idea? Um, there's the whitewashed but simmering kind of people, they're the, they're the ones that stand behind you in the grocery as the, the checkout aisle, and they see how much you got, and then they go to the next aisle over, right? Uh, they just can't quite wait for you. Or there's the, the person, I did a lot of driving this week, and there's the person that wants to uh, just pull out and zoom around you because you're actually doing the speed limit, right? You know those people, right? They're the whitewashed but simmering anger that's there, right? And, um, or this one, like I coach soccer, I coach my my boys in soccer, and there's always the opposing parents who are against us, right? And, they're, and you overhear them saying those things about your son or your daughter on the soccer field or your team, and, and they're angry about some call the ref made, and you know they're wrong, and you know, you're just kind of, the anger's building, right? You know those people. We meet angry people all the time. And, and of course, lest we get too quick to point our fingers, right? Maybe, um, maybe you're one of those people this morning. Maybe it's lingered throughout the week. Maybe it's just brewing under the surface. Maybe it's been there for a long time. At the heart of your struggle, at the heart of their struggle, at the heart of my own struggle, is when our way and our sense of right and wrong comes into conflict with others. What seems right to you and I all of a sudden doesn't, doesn't match with the actions and the intents of other people around us. Worse yet, like Jonah, sometimes our ways and our ideas about life actually conflict with God's heart, but we can't even see it. Remember back to the Sermon on the Mount. Some of you were here. We spent about six months on that, and pretty much every Sunday I drew our attention to a little phrase. Anybody remember it? God wants... Some of you were here for it, right? God wants your heart. That was the essence of the Sermon on the Mount. Well... God didn't have Jonah's heart. Or maybe better, Jonah didn't have the heart of God, right? Maybe that's a little bit better way to put it. But God wanted it. God wanted Jonah's heart, and he worked really hard to get it. In fact, some of us strain to kind of understand where Jonah fell off the rails. I mean, we've talked about it over the last couple of weeks, haven't we? He's had this near-death experience thrown into the ocean, sinking to the bottom of the sea. He's had this great deliverance, this miraculous deliverance at the hand of God. And, and then he's had this momentous spiritual experience. We talked about it last week in the context of our foxhole prayers, right? Those moments in life when we cry out to God and actually God is listening in those moments. This intensely religious experience He's been spared, and he dutifully heads off to do what God actually asked him to do the first time. Go to Nineveh, preach your message. But it's really not clear that he actually changed his heart. He changed his actions. But did he really change his heart? And the reason I say that is... Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 says this, but Jonah, but to Jonah, this seemed wrong, and he became very angry. What seemed wrong? The people actually repented. Now, Jonah was asked to preach. In our English Bibles, it's an eight word sermon. 
in Hebrew, it's actually a five-word sermon. He was asked to preach a message to the Ninevites, to turn or God was going to destroy them. It was a simple message. I think about it in the context of our own lives, those simple little things that we know we should do that sometimes we don't do. How about that? Take your wife out to dinner because she needs to be with you. Spend some time with your kids because they're growing up too fast. Reach out to your friend because they're hurting. Go visit them. Make that phone call. Forgive. You fill in the blanks. God's speaking to us simple messages all the time. And maybe like Jonah, you're running the other way. Or maybe like Jonah, your heart's just a little bit too hard and that doesn't make sense to you. But to Jonah, this seemed wrong. Really? Are you God, Jonah? This seemed wrong. We put ourselves in the place of God to try and figure out why is that message coming to me? Why did that prompt come to me? Am I supposed to do, what am I supposed to do with that? the people actually repented. They were Gentiles. They were Assyrians. They were Israel's sworn enemy. And and we don't know Jonah's personal story all that much. We don't know what he was taught growing up. We know that he was prophesying on behalf of the king in in Israel, the northern kingdom. He was prophesying on his... Because he was pro-Israel. He was a nationalist. So... The Gentiles are going to save the Assyrian people? Like, no, God, you're our God. You're for us. You, we, you belong to us. You're going to help us become this great nation. What on earth are you doing? I'm not doing that. That doesn't seem right to me. You know, in moments, in, in sadly, maybe it's seasons of my own anger, It's nearly impossible to see my way through it. Let me tell you a little bit of a story. On New Year's Day, 1997, my wife and I and our three-and-a-half-month-old daughter, we were driving out of Rochester, and we were landing in Chicago, Illinois. We had brought all of our belongings. We moved out. We thought we were done with Rochester. We moved them into a place called the Olive Branch Mission. It was a four-story former monastery. Now it was a homeless shelter. We put all of our stuff in the basement. We moved up to the fourth floor, and that's where we started life in Chicago. But it was good. We felt called there. We felt like we were on a mission. We had a purpose. We were there because God led us there to be missionaries to the south side of Chicago, to this wonderful organization that had been around for 140 years at that point, or 130 years. We're like, man, this this is great. And we lived into it. We eventually found a house, and we worked there, and we went to church there, and we were all in. That was life for us. It didn't take very long for us to entertain the idea that we would be there forever. Chicago was home. We made friends there. We had two more children there. We have lots of ties and lots of roots in Chicago. And we really do love that great city. Yet... A couple of days prior to New Year's Eve 2003, nearly seven years later, we were driving all of our belongings back to Rochester. It was a curveball that didn't really sit well with me. For the sake of our marriage, for the sake of my own physical and mental health, it was important that we sacrifice that dream of living like missionaries in that foreign city. But suffice it to say, I was pretty upset. For several years, I grieved that decision. I struggled to find new purpose. I struggled to find a new plan, and I tried many different things. I complained, maybe partly with my words, but for sure in prayer, But definitely with my actions, my choices, I struggled. I struggled. 
And I fell into depression, which I didn't even know at the time like was a thing for me. I don't think I ever said, just kill me now, God. Like, it never got quite to that point. But, you know, there's some pretty deep stuff that goes through your head when you are in a place of deep hurt and pain and struggle like that. I was part angry. I was part hurt. I was part just lost. And I think, well, well, I just, I was not on the same page with God. There are so many stories like that all around us. Anger can be stirred up from many different sources. Many of our African brothers and sisters never thought they'd be living in refugee camps, much less being transplanted to America, to a whole new country and language and system and economics and all. That wasn't on their radar. Many a child never thought that their parents would separate. Many a spouse never thought that they'd be living single again. Many couples never thought that they'd have to move for the promise of work. Many individuals have received a health diagnosis that they just didn't see coming. Whether it's family or friends or jobs or volunteerism or personal health, we're sometimes thrown off by the changes that God puts into our lives. And very often it's those changes that challenge, even test our very character. It's one thing to know about God. Everybody in here knows something about God. But it's a whole nother thing To actually think like him, to love him, and to trust him in every situation of life. What's interesting about Jonah is that in this book, in his book, he seems to indicate that he saw this change coming. And maybe prophetically he did. Or Maybe it just speaks to his deep understanding of God in spite of his own personality and character flaws. I bet Jonah, maybe like some of us, could give all the right Sunday school answers. More than just Jesus, right? He knew a little bit about God. If you read some of what he wrote and some of what he said, you could find it in some of the other prophetic writings in the Old Testament. God was telling him things the same way he was speaking through some of the other prophets. But like us, it's possible that we can know a lot about God and never allow it to fully form who we are. We can hide all kinds of bitterness and anger and resentment, frustration toward God, and whitewash it all on Sundays. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing today? becomes this show. So much so that so many non-Christians out there or, or unaffiliated people to the church today don't even want to come in because they're afraid they got to have it all cleaned up to come in and feel welcome in the church. That's not what church is meant to be. We're not a bunch of people that got it all figured out. Raise your hand if you got it all figured out. It's the one time I don't want to see any hands, right? We're struggling. And the world needs to know that we're struggling because the world needs to know we're working through it too. Right? Jonah is the kind of person that knew a lot because God had revealed himself, and yet he hadn't really dealt with any of those deeper questions that he had. Those questions that cause us to doubt, to distrust, to get mad at God. I think some of you are thinking of some of those right now. Why is the church the way it is? Why do people act that way? Why was I treated that way? Why is my husband the way he is or was? Why are my kids treating me this way? Why does the world seem like it's successful when I try to live for you, God, and my life just seems like it's one struggle after another, after another, after another? 
you know I'm only scratching the surface of what's deep down we've got to deal with. So there he sits. Jonah, stewing. He's upset. He's angry. He's bitter. He's bitter about the changes, sort of, because again, what is he really angry about? That God saved the Assyrians? Yes, yes, we know he probably hated the Assyrians. We know that he thought God was their God. What is he really angry about? He had to change his view of the world. He had to change his view about who God is and what God was calling him to do. He was angry because God was asking him to do something that he didn't want to do. Anybody been there? So Jonah leaves the city knowing that they are in the process of repenting. And he goes outside the city to see if God will actually follow through and destroy the city, or will he relent? He already thinks he knows where it's going, but he's going outside the city to wait it out, because he's just got to see. So he's on a hill, and he's hoping that God doesn't change his mind. Prior to leaving, he prays this prayer, he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Did Jonah know who God was? He knew who God was. Did it change who he was? Hadn't quite made that transfer. God knew, Jonah knew, that God's character always wants to pull people close to him. You need to hear that today. God's character, his unchanging character, is that he always wants to pull you close to him. He wants to be in relationship with you. That never changes. He is gracious and compassionate, even with those of us who are stubborn, willful, and hell-bent on doing things our own way. Even when we struggle like Jonah did. If we repent, God will relent and restore his people to him. It was true in Jonah's day. It was true for Jonah. It's true this day, and it's true for you and me. If we repent, God will relent because he wants to be in relationship with you. I want you to notice what God does to help Jonah reorient his thinking. This is great. This is really fun. You know what he does? It's right there in the text. I'm not telling you anything that it's a secret here. He asks him a question. Is it right for you to be angry? How many times has God asked you a question that got right to the heart of the matter? Anybody there? Had that thought run through your mind? God did a similar thing for Job when Job was struggling. If you look over into the book of Job, and in fact, while he asks Jonah only three questions, guess how many questions he asked Job? There's at least 66. And if you look within the verses, there's probably a few more. Here's a few, starting in Job 38. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? And on and on and on it goes. God likes to ask questions. He asks questions directly of Adam and Eve. Where are you? He asks questions of Hagar and Elijah, and Ezekiel, 
and on and on it goes. Even Jesus asked questions of his disciples. Who do the people say I am? God likes to get us to think. He likes to get us to think about him, and he often gives us prompts to consider exactly what's going through our minds. But he doesn't stop there. He then gives us experiences. Isn't that cool? He gives us experiences to go along with the questions that he's asking in our minds. Notice the plant in this particular passage. Now, it says three times in here that God arranged. What's that speak to? When God does something three times like that in Scripture, that tells us something. God arranged. That's telling me that God was very personally invested in Jonah's life, very personally invested in getting something out of Jonah, helping Jonah to see something in his story. God knows how to get our attention. And he is often very, very personally involved and invested in making it happen. As with Jonah, so with us. God is personally invested in your life. It's one of the hallmarks of the modern evangelical movement is this idea of being personally connected to God. Yes, God is a corporate God, and much of what we know about God happens because we belong in community with one another, but God is also very personal, and he loves you, and he loves me, and he's reaching out, and he's doing things personally in your life to help you know him better. The very discomfort some of you are thinking of right now, and the distorted sense of right and wrong that you might be struggling with, it's well known to him. There's nothing going through your head right now that God doesn't already knew and didn't know before it even happened. He's working to change you, and he's offering opportunities for you to change. So, maybe he sends you a leafy plant, an out, a solution, a reprieve to a temporary struggle. But then notice the worm, because God arranged for the worm too. Just when you thought that God had intervened for your good, it all crumbles again. What's the worm in your life? And then the extreme discomfort, the scorching east wind, no shade, nothing to block the harsh elements. We're back at ground zero. We thought the answer had come, and in reality, it wasn't an answer at all. You see, the point of the leafy plant, the worm and the scorching east wind, was not to provide Jonah comfort, only to rip it away. Sometimes we think that God is some cosmic killjoy. He just wants to build us up so that he can tear us down. That's not the God that we serve. That is not who God is. God was making a point, as he so often does, right? We would do well to listen and to accept whatever that point is that's being made in our own lives. What's the point of those things in Jonah's life? See, Jonah would have known, as would most every person in that time and in that culture, both Jew and non-Jew, that there was an order of priority to life. According to their culture, the lowest form of life was the plant life. Then came animals, and then humans. This sort of follows the creation story, but it's a familiar pattern to most of the culture at the time. What God provided Jonah was an object lesson that was meant to call into account his view of why God's plans had changed. Because he cares about people, even the animals. Jonah got all up in arms over a plant, and God says, it's a plant. There are people out there that are dying. I was about to wipe them out. Your message was exactly what they needed. And why does that bother you? Your priorities are all messed up. Do 
What are your priorities? Is it your house? Is it your garden? Is it your favorite hobby or your job or your career? Maybe it's your children. Yes, your children can obscure your vision of what God is doing in and through you. What is it that God might be changing in you that's revealing some character issues that need to be addressed? Or maybe it's just finally creating some margin to simply deal with those deep down questions in your life. What is God arranging in your life to teach you more about his ways and his purposes? God might throw you some curveballs in life. Some of them might leave you angry and frustrated, very upset. Some of them might even make you despair. What? What are you doing, God? How am I going to get out of this one? Why now? Why here? Things were going so good. Why, why, why this? I don't need this, God. But God is compassionate. He is merciful. He is slow to become angry, and he is filled with unfailing love. His nature, his very character is rooted in the, de the desire to restore you and me. Desire is not to punish you, and his desire is definitely not to alienate you. The story of Jesus in the New Testament reaffirms this and reaffirms his heart and love for all people. On the last night of his life, Jesus prays one of the most heartfelt and compelling prayers you'll ever read in all of the Bible. In that prayer, Jesus lays open his heart, and he says, Lord, I pray that they will love each other as I have loved you. That's at the heart of the new covenant. That's at the heart of the New Testament. Love for one another. How did he love them? By giving up his life. He gave up his life for those he said he loved. John would later write in one of his little letters that without love for others, we simply don't know God. God's love for all people is the heart of the equation. James says that we should be quick to listen. You know it. Slow to become, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We, you and I, cannot love freely. We cannot love freely when we carry bitterness and anger in our hearts. Whether it's the curveballs in life, or the harm that's been done to us, or both, Love and anger cannot coexist. When our priorities are out of whack, when we care more about our stuff and our hobbies and all the things of life, more than we care about God's purposes and the people of the world, when God is in the second chair and disrupts our perspective, it's time to reorient ourselves and get back on his purpose and plan. Jesus said, love others as I have loved you. Loving others. Jesus' love is at the heart of this new covenant, our story, today's story. At the heart of God's nature, Jonah knew this, is love. But Jonah didn't get it. And sometimes, in fact, too many times, you and I don't get it. So let me close with one, two questions. Are you willing to confront whatever's preventing you from loving others today? 
Are you willing to let go of your anger in order to trust God? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and give us a few minutes to reflect on those questions. Take some time in silent prayer. Maybe take some time to write out what's on your mind and on your heart. If you need a piece of paper, there's a card, a connection card in front of you. You can use that. Maybe it comes in the form of a prayer that you'd like our church to pray with you about. You can fill that out on that card and drop it in an offering basket with our ushers or up here at the front in the altars after or during one of these final songs. Whatever it is that the Lord's speaking to you, respond today. And let the Lord minister to your heart today.